Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany and I'll be taking you through your PEDS cardio revision today. These are your matrix conditions. You really need to know your congenital heart defects. There will definitely be questions on it. Today, that's going to be most of what we cover, plus rheumatic fever and infective endocarditis. So your congenital heart defects are a huge topic and will make up a few questions on your exam. So it's important to know them. I've included the buzzwords for each condition on the slides and there's a table of them at the end as well. So if you're cramming, just learn those. Uh, but it makes a lot more sense when you learn the underlying physiology. So that's what we're going to spend most of this lecture doing. So let's get started. Um, so we can separate our congenital heart defects into two groups, our cyanotic and our acyanotic. If we remember our normal cardiophysiology of deoxygenated blood in the right heart and oxygenated in the left, higher pressure in the left than on the right. If we have one of these cyanotic heart diseases, for some reason the defect is causing higher pressure in the right side of our heart causing the deoxygenated blood to mix through a right to left shunt and enter our circulation, which then causes the less than normal oxygen levels being delivered to the body and the cyanosis. These are typically more serious, but less common than our acyanotics, which will have a left to right shunt because the higher pressure is still in the left. So there's still only oxygenated blood going out to our circulation, but mixed on the right going into our lungs. So these are our cyanotics and our acyanotics. You can remember the main cyanotic heart diseases with the numbering system one to five. So number one, truncus arteriosus, because it's only one great vessel leaving the heart and two for the transposition of the great arteries because there's two great arteries, but they're in a different position. Three for tri and tricuspid atresia. Four for tetralogy of Fallot because there are four defects that make up the condition and then five because total anomalous pulmonary venous return has five words in it. The main ones you need to know are two and four. Um, the others just know a little bit about, and I don't have a fun way to memorize the acyanotics, but there's no particular focus for them. You should really know them all. Super briefly on fetal circulation, this physiology will help you a little bit with your understanding of the defects. I won't go into it too much, um, but fetal circulation is higher pressure on the right side because the right atrium gets all of the venous return and blood from the placenta, and it goes through the foramen ovale um, to the left side and then out. You also have your ductus arteriosus, which goes from your pulmonary artery to your aorta. Um, yeah, and then when baby is born, this all changes. So your left-sided pressure arises and your foramen ovale will shut. Um, your ductus arteriosus will not close immediately, but will once you lose the maternal prostaglandins that are there to keep it open. Uh, it's important to know these shunts and where they are because a lot of our congenital heart defects are not singular defects um, and will rely on, for example, the ductus arteriosus to stay open for circulation. So let's start off with our acyanotics because some of our cyanotic defects also have VSDs and ASDs. So VSDs, a gap between our ventricles, it's the most common congenital heart disease. Um, genetic syndromes, maternal alcohol and smoking and infections are all risk factors for it. So it's a, a left to right shunt because of the higher pressure in the left. So you have oxygenated blood going into the deoxygenated side, which is why it's acyanotic because the blood going into the circulation from the left ventricle is still oxygenated. After many, many years, you can get this complication called Eisenmenger syndrome, which is where the continual excess um, of blood flow into the right ventricle causes hypertrophy of this muscle um, and increases your pulmonary resistance and gives you pulmonary hypertension. And eventually the pressure on the right side can actually exceed the pressure on the left side and you can get a reversal of this shunt, um, which pushes deoxygenated blood to the circulation. So it can actually become a cyanotic heart condition, but it's for the most part generally acyanotic. Once it gets to this really severe stage of Eisenmenger, you can't just close um, the defect like you would normally um, because it's actually contraindicated because of the high mortality rate involved um, and you'll need a full heart-lung transplant. 
so yeah, they are acyanotic unless they have this Eisenmenger syndrome um, and can, can be asymptomatic as well if the defect is small. They are prone to chest infections, heart failure and failure to thrive. On examination, you have a pansystolic murmur at the left lower sternal border. The smaller the defect, the louder the murmur, as you can imagine, because there's more blood trying to fit through the smaller hole and the more turbulent flow makes the louder sound. Uh, the management for this is patch closure unless they get the Eisenmenger syndrome. ASD, so a gap between your right and left atrium. So you have a left to right shunt. Risk factors are Down syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome, and Holt or AM syndrome, which is just an autosomal dominant condition characterized by an ASD, a first degree heart block, and upper limb abnormalities. You also have this wide fixed split. S2 because of the increased blood volume that's going through your atrial septum passing by your pulmonary valve um, it causes a delay in the closure of the pulmonary valve relative to your aortic valve closing um, and it's fixed because it doesn't change with respiration children are rarely symptomatic but with age they get long-term complications which we'll talk about on the next slide so investigations, as with all of our heart defects, an echo and a chest x-ray. Management is surgical, and since it's asymptomatic, it's usually done to reduce the complications that they can get in the future. So in their adulthood, they can get pulmonary hypertension, uh, heart failures, arrhythmias, Eisenmenger syndrome again, and you can also get what's called paradoxical emboli. So if you have a clot somewhere, um, it can flick off into the heart and pass through the left, um, pass through to the left side and out to your circulation to, for example, the brain and cause a stroke. It happens because even though the shunt is predominantly left to right, you do at times get this transient right to left shunt um, when things change. Okay, so just a quick one on AVSD, so a defect in the septum separating your atri atrium and ventricles. So there is blood flow between all four of your chambers. Uh, there's one common valve between all four. The risk factor to know is trisomy 21. It's the same investigations and complications as the other defects um, and also is surgical management. PDA, where your ductus arteriosus has failed to close postnatally. So usually it closes by week three, but if the baby is premature or the mother has had an induction and was given prostaglandins, it can stay open for longer. So you can also think of this as a left to right shunt because you have oxygenated blood in your aorta um, going into the pulmonary artery, which causes volume overload in our pulmonary vessels um, and extra strain on the heart and lead to heart failure, just like our other acyanotic defects. Presentation is a new murmur uh, with increasing ventilatory requirements. But as time goes on, the murmur will actually lessen when you get pulmonary hypertension, as there's no longer that loud shunting of blood from a high pressure side to a lower pressure side, because the pressures are now a little bit more even when you get to the stage of having pulmonary hypertension. If it's a large PDA, uh, the murmur can be described as a machinery murmur, which means it's loud, continuous and rumbling. They also have bounding and collapsing pulse, pulses um, and a wide pulse pressure. So a PDA is actually needed in certain defects to ensure that we get oxygenated blood um, and mixing, which could be necessary for survival. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Management wise, you don't always need to fix it, especially if it's small. In premature infants, you can give NSAIDs because they decrease the synthesis of prostaglandins, which is keeping the duct open. Um, but this needs to be done in small babies only. If they're over five kilos or have a big PDA, then it needs to be surgical management. Okay, so coarctation of the aorta. You get narrowing of your aortic arch, um, but before your ductus arteriosus, so it usually happens about here. Um, so this messes with the pressure and the blood flow going through your heart. So everything before the narrowing in your aortic arch um, the arteries that are here, so your brachiocephalic, your common carotid and your subclavian are all supplied by your oxygenated blood as normal. After the narrowing, so here, the pressure um, is so low from such little blood squeezing through 
um, that the deoxygenated blood in the pulmonary circulation has a higher pressure and will actually move through the PDA and mix with your oxygenated blood and go out through the rest of your aorta and supply your lower limbs. So that is why you get a pressure difference on examination. Your upper limb, everything that's supplied by these vessels will have a higher blood pressure than your lower limbs. And you'll also have some lower limb cyanosis as well. And there will be a radio femoral delay. Um, you can also get an ejection systolic murmur, um, which is loudest at your left upper sternal border and the back. The risk factor for no, to know for this condition is Turner syndrome. Okay, so let's move on to our cyanotic heart conditions now. Number one, truncus arteriosus, where there's only one vessel leaving the heart because the pulmonary trunk and aorta have failed to properly divide. There is a ventricular septal defect, which allows blood to mix and enter this common artery and go out into your circulation. I've included management of these conditions on the slides for your knowledge and reference, but you won't have to know them for your exams. They're all fixed with basically some type of surgery. So transposition uh, is where your aorta and your pulmonary artery have switched places. So they essentially cause two closed circuits um, of deoxygenated blood going through your right atrium, your ventricle, and then your aorta. Um, as you can imagine, this is not compatible with life. And so there has to be other cardiac defects in place to allow for the mixing of blood, which is usually a septal defect. On examination, you will get diminished pulses because of the poor perfusion and there will be no murmur or there will be a murmur associated with the ASD or VSD. So you can see it on an x-ray. It will have this really large round, what they call egg on string heart shape and you can do an echo as well. There's also a hyperoxia test, um, which you'll get a result of less than 150 millimeters of mercury. And just for your interest, so this test is used to differentiate between cardiac and respiratory causes of cyanosis. So it will measure the partial pressure of oxygen in your radial artery. And if there is cyanosis from a right to left shunt cardiac cause, then no matter how much oxygen you give, there will always be mixed blood and continued um, hypoxia. So hypoxemia, sorry, um, and a low partial pressure of oxygen. But in a pulmonary cause, the issue is that you're not getting enough oxygen. So when you give them more oxygen, it will improve and improve your PaO2 result. Um, so management for this condition is that you wanna keep the PDA open um, to allow for the mixing of blood between the two looped circuits while you wait for surgery. Tricuspid atresia, you don't have to know much about this. It's basically when the valve fails to form. So the blood goes from your right atrium to your left atrium to your left ventricle and right ventricle through um, septal defects. And it's just a lot of mixed blood going around. Okay, tetralogy of fallow, the other really important one to know. So it's a combination of four defects and it's easier to think of them in pairs um, because you have a pulmonary um, pulmonary outflow tract stenosis, which then means you'll have ventricular, right ventricular hypertrophy because the muscle is working so hard to pump all the blood through a smaller area. And then you have a VSD as well. Um, so you'll have an overriding aorta because of your VSD, uh, which means that the aorta is positioned directly above the VSD and gets blood from both ventricles. So this is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease. The presentation of tet fallow is cyanosis, but not always straight away. And they get these things called tet spells, which are acute episodes of hypoxia. So this happens when the child is doing any strenuous activity like crying or feeding in young babies or exercise in some of our younger children. Um, it causes anything that basically causes increased O2 demand. So the heart tries to pump more blood um, around the body but it's mainly deoxygenated blood from your right to left shunt. And you have, and that's why you get the cyanosis and the hypoxia. So when they have a TET spell to fix it, you need to um, ask them to squat. Um, and basically what that does is it kinks the femoral arteries in their legs, um, which increases vascular resistance. And the, it, it increases vascular resistance in your peripheral arteries and increases your systemic pressure, which increases the pressure in your left ventricle. And this will provide a temporary reversal of the shunt. 
um, as the left ventricular pressure will exceed the right ventricular pressure. So their murmur will also disappear during the TET spell because of the reduced pulmonary blood flow. Normally though, their murmur is a harsh ejection systolic one like you see in pulmonary stenosis. Okay, investigations. On a chest X-ray, you will see this uh, boot shaped heart. You do an, ex an echo and do a hyperoxia test that we talked about before. Management for it is to fix the VSD and the stenosis, and then the other half of those issues will be fixed too. So there's more detailed management um, on this slide too that you can look over, but I don't think it will be examined in that much detail. Okay, total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Just know what it is. Uh, it's where the pulmonary vein drains into your right atrium instead of your left atrium. So you have everything draining into your right atrium, your um, SVC systemic circulation and your pulmonary vein and blood from there all go into your right atrium. So for survival, you need an ASD to get some of the oxygenated blood out to the rest of your body. Uh, just a slide on murmurs and some buzzwords. Image occluded, it, Anki it, I won't go into it now, you can read over it later, particularly the features of innocent murmurs would be good to know. And more buzzwords here, if you're very short on time, I would definitely recommend memorising these. Alrighty, so that's all the congenital heart defects. It's the biggest, most important topic to know. Um, we're now going to cover the other random ones that you should know as well, starting with rheumatic fever. So it happens after you have an infection to a group A beta hemolytic strep infection a few weeks after the initial complaints of strep throat. So the symptoms are to know other ones from the Jones criteria. I like the mnemonic on this slide to differentiate our major and our minor criteria. And just so you know what you're actually listing off when you're asked what the symptoms are. Um, chorea are involuntary movements, and I have a picture of the rash um, on the next slide. So these are the subcutaneous nodules that you get, and this is the rash that you get. I've also got here a different mnemonic for the Jones criteria. This is probably the one you learnt last year for the major criteria. I personally like the other one because I find the minor one easier to remember in that format, um, but I really don't think you have to memorize it. The exam question will probably be that, you know, someone's had strep throat and now they have this weird rash and joint pain. What is it? And this will be the answer. So to diagnose it, you need a culture or antibody testing suggesting rheumatic fever, as well as two major or one major and two minor criteria. You'll also see raised inflammatory markers uh, and you can get some heart imaging too. Management for this will be single dose IM Benpen uh, for ease of compliance or uh, phenoxymethyl penicillin for 10 days orally. They need prophylactic antis for a long, long time afterwards. And when that is stopped is based on cardiac imaging and specialist input and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's important to counsel them on that in case it comes up that they'll be on antibiotics for a while afterwards. And then there's also um, management for your specific uh, symptoms that they get like NSAIDs for the joint pain, et cetera. Lastly, just quickly on infective endocarditis, I highly doubt this will come up and I'm sure we can all rattle off the peripheral stigmata of it in our sleep. But anyways, it can be strep or staph or some of our gram negatives. Symptoms are a new murmur and fever and all the other stuff we know, but it's very rare in adults to see those signs and even more so in children. So management with our BFG antis, um, Benpen, Fluclox and Gent. And that's it for Pete's cardio. Uh, best of luck to everyone on your exams. I'm sure you'll all smash it. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me.